Hi, my name is Greg Manuel. I'm the Associate Executive Minister for the American Baptist Churches of Nebraska. And over the next half hour or so, we're going to talk a little bit about Baptist history. This is not designed to be a conversation that will encompass everything that's happened in Baptist life over the last 400 years, but it will hit some high points along the way that kind of demonstrate uh, some of the major themes and key events in the story of Baptists and the larger Christian tradition. Um, this is also not a complete understanding of Baptist theology. Uh, it will hit a few things along the way um, that, that highlight what Baptists believe all across Baptist traditions, along, uh, but it is not designed to be a comprehensive understanding of what all Baptists believe everywhere. Um, and, and more importantly, this is going to be a study of where the Baptists in the United States um, emerged and more importantly where the Northern Baptist tradition became the American Baptist Churches USA. So we're going to kind of follow that trail from England to the United States to Northern Baptist to ABC USA. So it's a very specific video about Baptist history and how the American Baptist Churches USA reflect on um, our tradition. But some things that are gonna that, that are gonna be thematic throughout the conversation are that Baptists are a confessional people. Um, Baptists have long uh, been people who write down what they believe and reflect on um, on Scripture and their context and their cultures, and and they write down how they're engaging the world uh, based on the teachings of the Bible and how they see God moving in their midst. And so Baptists have written down many different kinds of confessions of faith over the years. Um, and every generation or two, we have to go back and examine those beliefs and say, is this still what we believe about scripture and where God is moving in our midst and the role of church and, and these sorts of things? Um, and, and, this, and that leads us into the second point, is that Baptists are a contextual people. Uh, Baptists have long been a people who are influenced and impacted by their cultural context, which is why Baptists in Africa or Asia are different from Baptists in Europe or South America, which are different still from Baptists in North America. And so when we write down these confessions of faith, when we examine what it is that we believe as Christians and, and, and how we're living out our Baptist witness within the larger Baptist tradition, um, we, we are trying to figure out, uh, based on our context, what is it that Baptists are doing. Um, and then the next thing is that Baptists are a community people. Baptists firmly believe in the autonomy of the believer, uh, the autonomy of local churches, um, but we also believe that Baptists are better when we come together in a faith community called a church, and that those churches are better when we come together to form associations and regions in order to extend our ability to do mission and ministry, and that these regions that have partnered together to form different societies and, and and larger uh, national bodies are better when we partner together to form um, our best mission and ministry that can impact the entire world. So Baptists are, are confessional people, they're contextual people, and they are communal people. Um, there will also be slides along the way that will kind of help you follow our conversation. So let's just jump right into a little bit of Baptist history. It's going to begin in England. Um, the first known Baptist groups began in 1608 or so with a band of Puritan separatists who were exiled to Amsterdam. This group was led by John Smith and Thomas Helwes. Now these dissenters, they broke away from the Church of England because of a belief that the church had become somehow corrupt and, and a little bit too institutional. Um, they believed that the best way to reform the church was to leave it. John Smith had spent a few years uh, trying to work within the network of the Church of England as he studied scripture and thought about uh, how the uh, Christian tradition was being applied in the English context of the early 1600s, uh, he began to say that things needed to shift and things needed to change, um, but he was realizing that he was not going to be able to make the kind of change that he sought, and that he was a little bit different kind of a Christian believer. And so he, he, he found a group of people that separated from the Church of England and they banded together around some common beliefs about baptism and the reading of scripture 
and the way that uh, churches should be autonomous and independent. Uh, this group left England and ended up finding their way to Amsterdam, where they met in a bakery for about two or three years. Uh, John Smith eventually left the um, Baptist church that was there, became a Mennonite. He had some confusion over whether his baptism was authentic or not. He was really kind of a deep seeker type personality. Um, but the group was left, what was left of the group was led by a lawyer named Thomas Helwes. And he guided this group um, into uh, what it was to be a Baptist church. After being in Amsterdam for a couple of years, they decided that they would have a more uh, impact and, and, and a more clarif clarifying role in their place in the Christian story and what it was to be a Christian church if they went back to England. And so in 1611, Helwes and 10 congregants from uh, that church in Amsterdam came back to England. They planted a church just outside of London in a town called Spitalfield. And they um, began to emphasize things like church autonomy, priesthood of the believer, baptism by professed believers, and religious freedom. Um, and these were things that gained uh, popularity not only as a result of the Enlightenment, but as a result of thought in the Christian world as well. Now, these earliest Baptists, Thomas Helwes uh, and others, they, they, they were beginning to write down these confessions of faith. And remember, these confessions are shaped by their context. They're in um, the 17th century England. They're separatists from the Anglican community. And so they, um, Thomas Helwes penned a couple of key documents. And, and the first one was called A Declaration of Faith of the English People remaining in Amsterdam and Holland, which he wrote before coming back to England. And then immediately after coming to Spitalfield, he wrote a short declaration of the mystery of iniquity. And these are the documents where he spelled out the early Christian beliefs. This is the first really written Baptist confession. And so he emphasized that baptism was for individuals who professed belief in Christ. This was a big break from earlier traditions where people were baptized as infants uh, to be part of the church. Sometimes that, um, that baptism was attached to citizenship. So if you were baptized into the Church of England, it also became a citizen of the country. Um, and so when people were being asked to be rebaptized as adults because they've made a confession of faith as, uh, as, as, as young teens or adults and, and have declared that they believe in, in Jesus and that baptism was for these sorts of professions of faith only, uh, it brought into a lot of questions theologically and um, globally as the idea of, of citizenship. Uh, immersion became the official form of baptism in 1641. Um, it was practiced by uh, tradition um, through immersion before that. However, it was first written down in a document in 1641. Um, communion spiritually connected Christ to those who partake it. So communion became an ordinance alongside of baptism. Um, and, and so this is a little bit different than maybe a, uh, other traditions um, where it's a sacrament. It's, it's, it's believed that taking communion, doing baptism, a few other rites along the way are part of the salvation process. For Baptists, um, communion and the Lord's table are not um, things that uh, gain you salvation theologically they are reflections of a response to the salvation that Christ has already provided and so we participate in these things as as responses of following in the ways of Jesus uh, Thomas Helwes also championed the small church um, he said this in in one of his documents quote to know each other so that they may perform all the duties toward one another Therefore, a church ought not to consist of such a multitude as cannot have particular knowledge of one another. So the idea here is that churches should remain at such a size that everybody inside the congregation can have an intimate knowledge of one another. And so this is one of the things that American Baptists kind of still pride ourselves on is that um, it's nothing really against large churches. If you have big ministries, that's great. 
but the idea is 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 intimate smaller congregations uh it's better in an american baptist thought to have many small churches than it is to have one large church because this way everybody can intimately connect to one another um, he also believed in church order and he established male and female deacons and leaders uh, this is a pretty bold move in 1611 but listen to this quote quote the officers of every church or congregation are either elders who by their office especially feed the folk concerning their souls or deacons men and women who by their office relieve the necessities of the poor and the impotent brethren concerning their bodies the idea here is that men and women leaders are part of the church. Uh, they all have a role to play in meeting the needs of the gathered body and the surrounding community. Uh, he also believed in complete freedom of conscience in matters of religion. This is a key Baptist foundational understanding of how and why we have independent, autonomous congregations um, and, and priesthood of the believer. Listen to this quote. For men's religion to God is between God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Remember context. They have a king. And so they're saying the king cannot be the ultimate judge of your religious belief. Continuing on, he says, Neither may the king judge between God and man. And then he takes it a step further when he says, Let them be heretics, Turks, Jews, or whatsoever, it appertains not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. The idea here is that uh, an individual's belief is between them and God alone. No king, no magistrate, no government should be allowed to dictate what it is that a person believes about scripture and church and God and all the other religious beliefs that go with it. But he takes it a step further in that um, whether they have no beliefs, bad beliefs, uh, he uses the term Turks, which is uh, modern day understanding of, of Muslims, um, Jews or whatsoever, that this government should not punish people for being of a different religion or having different theological beliefs. It's not the place of government. And so um, this is a big part of Baptist belief. The separation of church and state is probably the most common phrase used today, um, but it's rooted here in this 1611 document written by Thomas Helwes. He also believed that church members are united under a covenant, and this covenant gave focus to faith, fellowship, and discipline. So people come together. Covenants are different than contracts in the sense that covenants are that you will hold up your end of the bargain even when the uh, rest of the party does not. You see all over throughout the scriptures where God makes covenants with his people. He will be their God if they will obey his ways. And then God is always faithful to the covenant even when the people are not. Um, this they were uh, these earliest Baptists. They believed that Christ's atoning sacrifice was for, for all people, um, not just a chosen few. So these earliest Baptists, they were more what they called general Baptists. They lean into a more Armenian theology. And then um, rather than particular Baptists, which came later, uh, but kind of have been the dual streams of, of Baptist thought is you had your general Baptists um, and then your particular Baptist, which is today more of what we would call a Calvinist tradition or reformed. Uh, they, these early Baptists and even today still Baptists are intense students of Scripture. We love the Bible. We love talking about Scriptures. We like talking about the narrative of the Bible. It is what is the foundation of everything we do. If we can't defend anything that's happening in the church or our, our behavior or actions or beliefs, if they're not defensible from Scripture, then we really probably ought to drop it. Um, this is kind of our, our, our deep um, baseline is that it has to be part of scripture. And we also believe in local church autonomy. Uh, Helwes believed that congregations received their authority directly from Christ and mediated that authority through the community of believers. Each congregation was responsible for its mission and ministry, and this is a belief that 400 years later is something that we still hang on to. 
But the earliest Baptists, they were also community oriented. So each individual believer was asked to be part of a faith community called a church. And pretty early on, after about eight or nine churches were formed in and around London and Southern England, uh, they formed associations where these churches would gather together for the sake of fellowship, discipline, and mutual encouragement. They would reaffirm common beliefs, they would encourage one another, and they would respond to potentially divisive issues. Um, and so these, these churches, they would gather and they would talk about theology and they would encourage one another and they would train pastors and, and they would talk about um, what we call a Christian education, you know, Bible study, this sort of thing. And, and, and they, they had these conversations and, and whatever decisions they made or, or, or guidance they wanted to provide at the associational level, was taken back to the local churches as matters of suggestion. And so each local church was allowed to decide on its own how it was going to apply what was discussed at the associational level. And so again, you have the association, which is kind of an independent organization. Uh, and then you have the individual churches, which can respond to what's happening at the larger level, however they choose, just as individuals are called to respond to what they're reading in scripture um, as, as best that they can. Well, Baptists eventually uh, do make their way to the New World. They come to America. The strongest beliefs for Baptists in America um, come to the um, that that come to the immediate foreground is the idea of religious liberty, and this is best exemplified in Roger Williams. In 1631, Roger Williams came to Massachusetts as an ordained English Puritan pastor in the Church of England. Now, Roger Williams was as brilliant as as he was argumentative. Um, controversy constantly surrounded his entire life, and he was what we might call today a little bit of a radical for his time. Um, some of his kind of radical beliefs in 1631 in the, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony included that he believed that Native Americans were not subjects of England and thought that the land that the colonists were residing on should have been purchased or somehow negotiated from the uh, uh, Native Americans who lived in that land. He also believed in individual and church autonomy, even though these Puritan separatists that left England and came to the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, did so under the auspices of religious persecution and religious freedom. Once they came and had their own colony, they established a, a state church um, and wanted everybody to be part of that church. Um, and so they were doing the exact same thing that they were escaping from. Um, he also insisted that people not attend the Church of England in Massachusetts. Now, this was a major problem given as how he is an ordained priest in the Church of England. This is his job and this is why he came to the New World. And then he also believed that government set the laws but in matters of religion should be left up to the individual. Now he, because of these controversial beliefs and the fact that he was always kind of pushing the envelope and, and getting in debates with uh, government officials and church leaders, um, they were about to put him on trial, place him in prison, and probably issue a death sentence of some sort. And it was about that time that he decided to flee into the wilderness, leaving his wife and, and young daughter behind. Um, and he spent a winter in the wilderness of the New World. He was taken in by the Narragansett Indians, um, in what is now Rhode Island, and he spent the winter with them. They, they kept him healthy, and eventually he, he planted the first Baptist church in the United States in 1638 in what is now Providence, Rhode Island. Now, John Clark started the First Baptist Church of Newport, Rhode Island, right across the bay um, shortly thereafter, but it is firmly believed that uh, Roger Williams' church in Providence, Rhode Island, was the first Baptist church on American soil. It, <coughs> excuse me. It is still a church that is in existence today. They have a pastor, they have a congregation, they have everything a church does. It's, it's, an act, it's the oldest active uh, Baptist church in the United States. Uh, you can go visit the church. Uh, you can take a tour of the facilities and the building. It is still the original structure uh, from that 1638 building. And so it's, it's not only a um, Baptist landmark, it's a, it's a United States landmark. It's, it's one of the oldest structures in the U.S. Well, anyway, uh, Roger Williams um, 
he was always kind of a spiritual seeker and much like John Smith, he eventually left the church that he planted um, as its pastor and official member. Um, but he, he did become a tireless advocate for religious freedom. And so he became a, um, a representative of the Rhode Island uh, people and went back and forth to England trying to create a charter that would allow for religious autonomy. Um, and so he spent the rest of his life in civil government and then he eventually created a charter for Rhode Island and got permission to include this statement, quote, none be accounted a delinquent for doctrine provided that it not be directly repugnant to the government or the laws established. This is from the Rhode Island Code Law. Basically, Roger Williams was the first person to write into a U.S. Uh, document that religious freedom was foundational to the establishment of the colony. Baptists didn't really grow all that quickly in the United States at this point, even 15 years after the establishment of First Baptist Church Providence and First Baptist Church in Newport. They were the only two Baptist churches in the New World uh, for a while, but eventually they started to grow and gain in popularity. First Baptist Church of Boston was planted in 1665 by Thomas Gould. First Baptist of Kittery, Maine was planted in 1682 by William Screven, and then that congregation planted First First Baptist Church of Charleston, South Carolina in 1690. So, um, and then on top of that, there's, there's immigration coming into the New World and people that were already Baptists from England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland began to come to the United States and plant uh, congregations as well. In the 18th century, Baptists also suffered persecution uh, from the state and other Puritan denominations uh, for their understanding of religious liberty and freedom of worship. And so there's kind of this idea that um, Baptists didn't want to have state-sanctioned churches, so they went as far as not registering their churches with the state or even getting permission to plant them in the first place. And so many times their churches were uh, closed. Uh, the pastors were fined or put in jail for short periods of time. Sometimes properties were confiscated. But um, the largest growth of Baptists happened in and around Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania because they had similar charters. Uh, the New Jersey and Pennsylvania ones were modeled after Roger Williams' charter in Rhode Island, which created religious freedom um, and separation of church and early ch separation of church and state ideas in the New World. And so as churches started to crop up, they began to do, just like the churches in England, they began to create associations where, where groups of churches would gather together in order for encouragement, understanding of theology, they would train pastors and the like. So on July 27th, 1707, five churches um, gathered together to fix an annual meeting of an association to quote, mediate and execute designs for public good. <clears throat> This became known as the Philadelphia Baptist Association. The Philadelphia Baptist Association is the oldest Baptist association in the United States. It is still in existence today. It is actually a region within the American Baptist Churches USA. And this association was formed to train and examine pastors, oversee ordination, provide discipline, and share theological strength with one another, and at times to plant congregations. Now, just like the associations in England, this, this association and all associations since then and regions um, were, were advisory and non-binding um, decisions. So all these churches would come together, they would discuss these topics, they would train pastors, but then they, local churches could go back to their homes and decide how much or little of whatever um, advice was given at these associations to apply in their local setting. When the Revolutionary War started to happen and um, the colonists began to push away from England for lots of different reasons, uh, taxation with rep without representation being one of the, the, the key cries of the early revolution, um, Baptists were early to jump on this side of um, the, the rebellion against England because they had been living under a taxation without representation as Baptists for a while already, remembering that their churches um, were not represented of the state and they were paying taxes for churches that they did not attend and for priests who were not their pastors. And so um, they were early um, believers in this and helped promote the, the cause of, of those uh, colonists. Uh, men like Massachusetts pastor Isaac 
Bacchus and Virginia Pastor John Leland uh, campaigned tirelessly throughout the nation, preaching and teaching anybody who would listen about religious liberty and freedom of conscience. Isaac Bacchus's uh, freedom of conscience idea became the foundation for religious freedom laws that were written into the Bill of Rights. Um, he was a lobbyist for the Continental Congress and a Baptist minister. And then John Leland caught the attention of Thomas Jefferson in 1786, which led to the Jefferson Bill for establishing religious freedom. Also a Baptist minister. It was during this time that Baptists grew the most, and so by the end of the century, there were over 60,000 Baptists in the country um, with 35 different associations. It was a very small portion of the population, but a growing and significant body uh, who helped create some of the foundational thoughts of, of, of the separation of church and state in the United States. Well, um, about this time, Baptists realized that associations were very powerful and meaningful. It extended their mission and ministry uh, throughout the, the, the areas. But they started to discover that if they created societies, societies that had very specific purposes and goals, they could get churches from a variety of different associations to sign on to this. And so associations uh, were for geographically near churches. Societies were more broad and they were more affinity based. And so um, there were societies that supported overseas and domestic missionaries. There were societies that uh, championed evangelical programs or evangelism. There were societies that uh, focused primarily on education and creation of schools. Um, other societies were specific towards benevolent issues and some were specific for women uh, to have rights uh, to, to vote and, and equal opportunities. And so so many of these small entities began to creep up that it made sense to start to create a formal structure around these societies. Um, and, and the idea was is that these societies would be, um, they, they needed a larger body to help structure how to collect funds and promote encouragement of support of these societies. And, uh, and since most local churches had limited funds, being part of these societies helped them to be part of something that they were passionate about in partnership with other churches and they could do more together than they could do apart from one another. Um, probably the the most famous and earliest society in the United States. Um, we have to kind of go back to our passion for missionary zeal, um, and the very first Baptist missionary that's often overlooked is a man named George Lyle. George Lyle was a freed slave from Georgia. Um, he eventually made his way down to Jamaica. Uh, while there, he sold himself back into indentured servitude, shared his religious beliefs about um, Baptist ideas of how to be a Christian with other slaves on the island. Uh, he eventually won his freedom back um, by, by paying off his indentured servitude over time, and he planted a church in Kingston, Jamaica, becoming the first Baptist church on that island. And so um, this all happened about 15 years before somebody you might know a little better, which is William Carey, ever stepped foot in India. William Carey is, is kind of labeled as one of the forefathers of the modern missionary movement. Um, this is because he created a society in England that had kind of an ongoing way of supporting him financially and kind of rallying many churches for the sake of sending out foreign missionaries. Um, but George Lyle was the first actual missionary, and then William Carey was kind of the first to create a society that kind of uh, intentionally um, up, uh, supported in, with the upkeep of, of missionaries. Um, for American Baptists specifically, in 1812, Adoniram and Ann Judson were uh, missionaries being sent by the Congregationalist churches in the U.S. They were going to go work with William Carey in India, and on their way, like will happen um they were reading the bible on the uh, on the on the boat ride there and they were practicing their translations from greek into english and it was then that they realized that baptism should be done by immersion and that baptism should be a profession of faith of somebody who's who's old enough to make that decision and so they spent all this time reading scriptures and they realized that they were Baptist in theology. And so they sent a letter back to the Congregationalists informing them that they could no longer in good conscience uh, receive funds or represent the Congregational churches. 
Um, a little after arriving in India, um, there, the third person of the story is Luther Rice. Uh, Luther Rice got sick and he had to come back to the United States, which was unfortunate for his health at the time, but very beneficial to the creation of our societies in American Baptist life. Luther Rice came back to the U.S. and he started rallying support from all the Baptist churches up and down the eastern seaboard um, and, and encouraging them to support missionaries that they didn't even know they had commissioned. And so the, he began to tell people about the story of, of Ann and Adoniram Judson and all these churches began to support them and, and give money. And so Luther Rice and others, um, they formed the first society in, in American Baptist life. It was called the General Missionary Convention of the Baptist Denominations in the United States for Foreign Missions. It was formed in 1814 to support the Judsons on their missionary work uh, into Burma. They had left India and gone into Burma. So this um, this group, this this foreign mission society, decided to meet every three years. It was called a triennial gathering, and it was our first formal body. This group eventually became what is now known as International Ministries. Um, State conventions and societies began to crop up all over the place as well. Um, the Baptist Publication Society was founded in 1824, creating such ministries as the Chapel Car um, and, uh, and distributed Bibles and Sunday School materials. The American Baptist Home Mission Society was also founded in 1832. If we're going to have missionaries that go into foreign countries, we also wanted to have missionaries that went into the uh, westward expansion of the United States and so into the French. Here. So Luther Rice and Henry L. Morehouse helped lead the, uh, the creation of this society, um, and they did things like um, focus on education, the creation of hospitals, children's homes, schools, and ministry to freed slaves. Um, in its first year, they sent 50 missionaries out into uh, the western frontier. One such ministry missionary, uh, rather, was Moses and Eliza Merrill, who made their way to this state of Nebraska and helped plant um, the earliest Baptist witness in the Nebraska Territory. Um, there were also women's societies like the Women's American Baptist Missionary Society in Seneca Falls in 1877, and it established education, equal rights, and voting rights, uh, or it fought for the establishment of those things for, for women. And then the American Baptist Home Mission Society um, was formed, or the women. Baptist Home Mission Society was formed in 1877 and with Joanna P. Moore as its first missionary. Um, all these societies began to form and there was a little bit of a controversy uh, you might have heard about called the Civil War that happened in the 1860s over many issues including state rights, abolition, and the freedom of, of slaves. Um, but it Earlier than that, 20 years before that, uh, Baptists began to have the conversation about slavery. Um, they had created a, people would come to the triennial event and they began to ask the question of, um, is it proper and right for people to be slave owners? It all came to a head in 1845 when Southern, um, ba Southern Baptist congregations came to the triennial event um, and they wanted to commission a slave-owning Baptist to go overseas as a foreign missionary. The group met um, and after several days of deliberation came to the conclusion that they could not in good conscience sponsor a slave-owning missionary to a, a, a place of missionary appointment. And so this ended up uh, creating the Southern Baptist Convention because the Southern churches that supported the right to, to own slaves um, pulled away from these societies and their partnership and fellowship with uh, what eventually became Northern Baptists. Um, this was not the only thing, but it was the prime thing that caused the division between Northern and Southern Baptists. So the Southern Baptist Convention was formed in Macon, Georgia in 1845. Uh, Northern Baptist Convention uh, did not actually develop until 1907, um, but those churches that were in the northern part of the country continued to associate together under this loose band of societies. Eventually in 1907, um, at Calvary Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., the Northern Baptist Convention was established and it brought together the three big societies of the time. It was the American Baptist Board of Education and Publication, the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society, and the American Baptist Home 
Mission Society. The idea was for all these things to color come under one networked umbrella, um, but per the tradition of our Baptist heritage, each of these societies are independent and autonomous. They remain so today. They each have their own boards. They have their own uh, executive directors. Um, they have their own ways of raising funds and resources. Um, we have now a way of kind of a cooperating together through United Mission where money goes to all of these groups in small pieces and portions. A vast majority of United Missions stays with regions, um, which is your local association of Baptist churches. In our case, it's Nebraska. In other places, it's of the 36 regions. It could be a city or it could be a state or it could be several states. It just depends on how your region is put together. But the idea is that um, this structure is that, that we choose to partner together for mission and ministry through a combined effort of a series of independent and autonomous societies, regions, local churches, and individual believers. In 1911 and on into 1913, another society was quickly formed. It was called the uh, Ministers and Missionaries Benefit Board, uh, better known today as MMBB. Um, and it was founded upon the concepts of Henry L. Morehouse, who felt support for older ministers um, and those in need was important. And basically, there wasn't a retirement program for ministers and for missionaries. They would spend their whole lives serving churches and the foreign mission fields. Um, then they would retire and they would have no other sources of income. And so they created this benefit board that would uh, allow people to invest small amounts of money throughout their life and then have something to live upon. Um, it eventually got its greatest support uh, from the philanthropist uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, who gave a series of smaller donations before finally making a $7 million contribution to MMBD to help get this retirement program off the ground. It is still in existence today. Um, um, they have a hundred years, over a hundred years of experience taking care of investments and um, helping us with our uh, retirement and other uh, important needs of, of ministers. Since the early 1900s um, in the 20th century, the American Baptist movement continues to move forward. Uh, we have had a couple of splits along the way, um, um, but there's been some good things as well. Um, in 1933, the General Association of Regular Baptists uh, split away. Um, in 1947, a, a group called Conservative Baptist Association split from ABC as well over theological and structural challenges. Um, early in the 20th century, this mostly had to do with a debate between fundamentalists and modernists. Um, I'll let you look up kind of what that is, but essentially the basics are that fundamentalism was a movement that grew out of a 12-volume commentary set called the Fundamentals. It was published in 1909. Um, and people were being asked and called upon to affirm everything written in this 12-volume commentary. Um, many people might have believed in that, the, the, the books. Others did not. They had their theological conundrums with them. Um, it was very Calvinistic in its outlook. It was really designed to be anti-evolution um, and anti uh, structural form criticism of, of, of scripture that was coming out of Europe. And, and so some, some people had problems with it theologically, and some people just had problems with it on a foundational basis because Baptists, again, are a covenant, or rather a, a confession people. We write down our beliefs, they are seasonal, and they are contextual. And what the people that most adamantly supported these fundamentals was asking uh, churches and pastors and Christians to do was to sign off and say that this is what we believe forever and always. They were trying to turn it into a creed. And this is not something that uh, Baptists really um, latch on to very much because we are confessional, we are non-creedal. And so it created this great fights and, and many um, churches split as a result of this, those who wanted to adhere to these, uh, this commentary and its beliefs forever and always. And Baptists who said, even if we do believe in it, we can't sign on to that because that's not who we are as Baptists. And of course, those who had theological problems with it would, would not sign either. But it was not all division and theological debate. Um, there were some really positive things centered around um, um, good ministry and work. Uh, you might have heard of Charles Evan Hughes. He was our first president in 1907. Uh, he was also the governor of New York, and he served as a chief justice of the Supreme Court and almost became president before losing the nomination to Theodore Roosevelt. 
Henry Stassen was also an American Baptist uh, leader and president of the Northern Baptist Convention. Um, he was also one of the founders of the United Nation Charters and served as governor of Minnesota. Um, and so he, he was a big part of politics and, and things as well. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Uh, pastored a church in Harlem, New York. His ministry to the poorest of the poor in the New York City brought to our conscience um, the need of urban poverty, or the care of urban poverty, but he also um, made us aware of many of the racial uh, injustices happening in, happening in the United States. He became the first black uh, congressman of New York in 1944. Walter Rauschenbusch was a champion of um, the social gospel and encouraged people to pay attention to the needs of others. Um, undoubtedly, the most famous American Baptist was Martin Luther King Jr., and we continue to dream with him to this day by being the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere we go. Um, there have been American Baptists who stood up and fought against Japanese internments uh, in the West Coast during World War II. There have been American Baptists who have stood up and fought for the rights of of women to vote and have equal opportunity in the workplace, Baptists who stand up for racial injustices and things along the way, uh, poverty and many other issues. Baptists have been on the front lines of many of these conversations and have led the way many times. Um, in later decades of the 20th century um, and into now, Baptists, American Baptists, um, we hang on to the joy and the pride that we are the most ethnically and racially diverse denomination in the United States. Um, we don't have a single um, ethnic group that makes up a majority of our Baptist life. Uh, we have a, a lot of different kinds of Baptists um, within ABC in the sense of there are um, Burmese Baptists, there are Latino Baptists, there are Baptists from Africa and Europe, and then of course the traditional American Baptists that have been part of our story for the last 250 or so years. Um, we have continued to send out missionaries across the globe. Um, we've uh, continued to encourage uh, women in ministry. Uh, in fact, uh, the the most recent interim general secretary was Susan Gillies, who was the former region executive minister of ABC USA, or I'm sorry, the region minister of American Baptist Churches of Nebraska and the general secretary of ABC USA. Um, and, and Baptists continue to partner with other denominations across um, the United States, making us pretty ecumenical. And so this is what it is to be an American Baptist. This is kind of our story. Um, we are a confessional people. We examine what we believe every generation or so. Um, we are a contextual people. Whatever's happening in the world around us, we respond to uh, in light of Scripture and our Baptist witness. And then we are a community-based people. We are better together. Um, we are better as churches. We are better as associations and regions. And we are at our best when we partner with our various societies and organizations, remembering always that each of these things are independent and autonomous, and we choose to partner together for mission and ministry so that we can have the greatest impact for the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I hope this was helpful, and this was a quick run through of just a, a little bit of Baptist history, and that it gives you kind of some insight into what we believe, why we believe it, and why we continue to move forward and ask questions. Why are we Baptist? What does Scripture say is our response to these unique situations in our life? And then how do we live out our Christian witness as a body called the church? Hey guys, just a quick little bit of bonus footage here. Um, I love books and they're very helpful to me and we just went through 400 years of Baptist history in just about a half hour. And so um, if you want to know more about what it is to be a Baptist uh, or understand uh, some, some, some Baptist theology and thoughts along the way, I want to give you some suggested readings uh, to help you along your journey. Um, probably the easiest and best book to, to go to real, real quick is a book called Down by the Riverside. It's by um, Everett Goodwin, and it does a really good job at laying out the mixture of how the theological beliefs of Baptists were shaped by history and impacted uh, the decisions that they made along the way. So check out this one, um, Down by the Riverside by Everett C. Goodwin. Um, I'll just put the links in the video uh, for you to use. 
Um, a really staple for seminarians and that sort of thing, depending on which school you go to, is probably going to be Bill Leonard's Baptist Ways. It's very, very helpful. Um, it's only slightly dated in the sense that it doesn't have the new American Baptist structures in it. It doesn't talk about um, uh, some of the newer things that have happened in the last 15 or so years. Um, he has other books that have been written since then that can kind of bring you up to speed on just those last few years. But if you want to know the 400 years leading up to the early 2000s, it's a really, really good book for that. Um, I did not go to an American Baptist school, uh, so mine was actually written by a Texas Baptist uh, by uh, Leon Macbeth called The Baptist Heritage. Um, I talked about a little bit of the difference between Calvinist and Armenian approaches. Bill Leonard does a really good job at kind of explaining that um, and helping you understand the uh, what we would call American Baptist, more general Baptist version. Um, Leon is the more of the uh, particular Baptist, spends more time in that part of the family. So if you want to know about them, this is a really good book for that. Um, a good simple textbook, like if you wanted to do a Baptist study with a small group or um, you know over the course of a summer or a winter or something specific like in a quarter, uh, you might use the story of Baptists in the United States. Uh, it's a very popular, uh, easy read for, for, for anybody, really. This is high school level reading, um, so I encourage anybody to check it out. It's by Pamela and Keith DeRusso, uh, Texas Baptist as well. Um, one that I come across recently was by uh, Freeman, uh, Freddie Freeman, and uh, he he wrote this book. Um, it's called Contesting, Ca or sorry, Curtis Freeman, um, Contesting Catholicity: Theology of Other Baptists. This is about finding a, a middle way between those two worlds that I just talked about, um, but also being ecumenical and being present. Um, it's, it's not an anti-Catholic book, uh, despite the title. Uh, really, what it is is about what did Baptists leave behind when they left uh, formal traditions like Anglicanism and and those sort of things, and uh, why did we do that, and, and what makes us unique. And so it's a pretty good read on that. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Baptist history books that just focus on the United States and not uh, England and those sort of things is Baptist in America by Kidd and Hankins, uh, Baylor University professors. Uh, if you can't tell, there's a lot of ba Texas Baptist history here uh, as well, but um, it's a great book. Um, and it really does a great job to explain what happened in the early uh, 20th century with American Baptists and the splits that they experienced in the 30s and the 40s. So this goes into really good detail with that as well. And just a couple of uh, books of, of very specific curiosity uh, you might be interested in. Um, this is about um, um, Roger Williams' church. This is a book about the first Baptist church in America. It's a great book. I picked it up when I got to visit this church um, a few years back. It's actually signed by the author there on the inside. Um, it's, a, it's a very helpful read and kind of an understanding of what it is to be um, or just the history of the church, I guess, and, and, and why it was, was founded by Roger Williams and, and how it continues to be an active congregation to this day uh, that has, you know, just like any other church. It's got its members and, and pastors and problems like everybody else. Um, specifically uh, uh, for the Judsons, we talked about Anne and Adoniram Judson, our first missionaries. There's a great book called The Judson History and Legacy by Hunt. Um, pick that up by Judson Press, so that's a good one. Um, if you need to know more about what it is to, to uh, uh, or why we're grateful for MMBB, you can read MMBB, A Pioneer in Employee Benefits. It's 100 years, the first 100-year history of, of their story. And then um, if you want to know why Baptists do what they do or practice what they practice as far as how they structure boards, why they have Sunday schools, um, how to organize um, a constitution and bylaws, um, you know, those sorts of things, real practical things. There's a great book called The Baptist Manual of Polity and Practice. It's by Maring and Hudson, edited by David Gregg. It is also a Judson Baptist book, um, so pick that up. It can help you out. So these and many others, I have entire shelves of Baptist books, but these are probably some of the most helpful. Um, and I go check them out, and you become a Baptist scholar someday soon. <laughs>